Exodus 9 and Proverbs 13. I was thinking uh, maybe you ought to take an offering after their service also. Yeah. That way if people are disappointed, they take money out of it. <laughs> oh, that was a bummer. <laughs> A year ago, last November, Bill Nye showed up or had a, an event at Purdue University. Does anybody know who Bill Nye yeah, is? He's a comedian turned science. <laughs> well, he had an event at Purdue, and we thought we'd show up, be a blessing to those folks. And <laughs> so they had a line that runs like a quarter mile, you know, people getting in line for this, and four or five people deep, and that went on for an hour as they're going into this event, and we stood there, I stood there with my sign, evolution is a fake religion, and I'd say, Reverend Bill's here tonight for catechism classes, <laughs> and I'd say, he's got an offering at the beginning of his service rather than in the middle of it, <laughs> and one of the guys walked down the line like he was part of the event, passing out tracks, Have, enjoy the program, enjoy the program, enjoy the program. <laughs> Yeah, it was something. <laughs> Young kid, a uh, kid saw us, and he said, "Are you here because of Bill Nye?" And I said, "Yeah, I am." He said, "I like your style." <laughs> yeah, this is my sister and brother-in-law. So they're Muslims, and so <laughs> so if he stands up and say "Al Akbar," get ready to duck. <laughs> Oh, well. Oh, well. Exodus 9. I don't know if this is one of the ones that you've heard me preach online. You know, I'm just amazed how that works. But a preacher friend that I've known, I, you know, I, I don't get asked to go to many places. Brother Inga Seth asked me, how, how, how often do you get calls to come and preach? And I said, never. <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it was. I just don't. And, I, and that's fine with me because I'm a homebody. Yeah. I was raised on a farm and just never left a farm. In fact, uh, after summer break, kids would ask me, how many times you come to town this summer? And I'd say, I think once. I think we came. And we're only six miles from town. Wow. I just, I just <laughs> kind of a homebody. Yeah. But... I preached this message years ago, and a pastor of 40 years thanked me after I preached this, and he said, that's answered so many questions for me. And then uh, another pastor had asked me to preach in a conference he had, and I said, what's the theme of your conference? And he said, the future of fundamentalism. I said, oh, okay. I said, would you mind if I preach why I'm not a fundamentalist? <laughs> and he says, brother, he said, I'll give you the pulpit. Go ahead and have it. And so I did. Amen. And I told him, I didn't want to be a party pooper, but uh, just give you a few thoughts. So I want to give you some differences between a fundamentalist, meaning a fundament, in this context, a fundamental Baptist versus a Bible believer. Okay? And it does kind of answer a lot of questions. So in Exodus 9, verse 20, this, this as in the context, you could see this is about the plagues. Okay, but it does give two basic attitudes how everybody views the Bible. Okay, so the two basic attitudes are 9 verse 20. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. Okay, what's the common saying there? Until the cows come home. Okay, so there we got that one. And then he says, and then the other attitude, and he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Okay, now if you would, Proverbs 13, 13. A double negative, that's going to be a real encouragement. Okay, that, uh, that disregard or no regard of the Bible, it, there's another variation of that idea in Proverbs 13, 13. Okay, whoso despises the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. See, so the feareth is the same in both of them. And so the other side is they either no regard or they actually despise it. So that's quite a variation in there. Okay, so that's how most people view the Bible who are opposed to the Bible. Disregard it, 
lackadaisical, just don't read it, don't care what it says, or openly despises it. And then the other side is the Bible believers. Hopefully we fear, and that means exactly what it says, fear the words of the Lord. If we would, let's go and pray. Lord, I pray you help us to understand this idea. I hope that this possibly would answer some questions, but yet help us to give a basic mindset of the ministry or of our approach in life of studying the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, now this is obviously a proper fear. Okay, in Isaiah 66, verse 2, he says, To this man will I look. Okay, and then the man that he looks is, he says, he has a contrite heart. And it says, he trembleth at my words. Okay, and so trembling at the words. The guy that demonstrated that is Ezra, Ezra chapter 9, verse 4, where he trembled at the words and became astonished. So that's the man that God looks at, one who fears the words. And then everybody else is on that other side where they don't regard it, they ignore it, they're lethargic towards it, they disdain it, they contempt it, they, are, they corrupt it. That's the whole other gamut on the other side. Okay, now I would say on one side that's the fundamentalism. And the other side are Bible believers. I look at all religions of the world as they're in a branch of fundamentalism. What I mean by that is any good athlete knows the fundamentals of his sport. Okay, he must, he should know the fundamentals of how to shoot or in basketball or whatever you, how the game is laid out. But a great athlete one t sometimes will come outside of the fundamentals in order to uh, win a game or whatnot. Okay, now, when you have a fundamentals in, in religion or beliefs, what I'm saying by that is if you would attend this certain uh, group, you will hear about all they're going to say within three to six months. And it's going to be a rehash over and over, over. Okay, Lutherans, fundamental Lutherans. You go to a Lutheran church, you're going to hear, probably learn everything they know, maybe within two months. <laughs> Okay, if it's um, Methodists, about the same. Okay, Evangelicals. Okay, uh, Pentecostals, what are you going to hear there? Every, pretty much every time you go, you know, hush on tie, tie, bow tie. You know, speak in tongues. You know, uh, roll your head back. You know, and go, ha, 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 you know, all this stuff. Okay, so it's, it's the same old, same old. Catholic Church, what's the, what are you going to hear there? The sacraments. Over and over and over and over. Fundamental Baptist, uh, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear buildings, budgets, and baptisms. Yeah, right. Attend church, attend church, be here, tithe, 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 be here, be here, tithe. Go get somebody else, bring them here, tithe. tithe. And that's about all you're going to hear. You're going to hear maybe some standards, convictions, depending on the pastor, of what, you know, he tries to have an outward appearance of people. But if you go there three to six months, that's really all you're going to hear. Okay, we attended Hiles Anderson for three years, and I, you know what, during that time period, I never heard Jack Hiles one time preach in the second coming. Not once. Okay, and his son-in-law actually categorized his sermons where there are 25 topics, and he does them over and over and over. That's fundamentalism. Now, people that stay in that environment have a lot of character, because they're not being fed, but they have some character. And when, especially if it's a big church, you've got to have some people that have some character. Right. And so you admire that and you learn from that. If you go to the Campbellites, you're going to hear baptized. You're going to hear this and that and this. You're going to hear basically all. If you go to the Muslims, what are you going to hear? The five pillars of the faith? In the jail, it's going to be kill whitey. <laughs> It's the fastest growing religion in the jails, and it justifies their reason of violence. Okay, so Calvinists. We, the Calvinists, you know, I was born a Calvinist because you can't choose it. You don't have a free will to choose the idea. And so I was born a Calvinist, and so they put it in a nice little tulip. You go up to Grand Rapids, Michigan, have a tulip festival, you know, and that's Calvinism. Okay, and so they put it in a nice little thing. The Arminians, what are they going to do? They're going to run you to, oh, Matthew 24 and then Hebrews 3 and 6 and, and hold the whole church in bondage that if you don't live the way I think you should live, you're going to hell. Right. Okay, you're going to lose your salvation. 
That's what I'm referring to fundamentalism. Buddhist. Okay, I went to Vietnam and went to a Buddhist pagoda. Huge thing. I thought I was at a KKK convention. I mean, they had all these pointy hats, you know, and they sat in this rows and stuff like that. My son was with me, and he had this little uh, plastic bottle, and, and he was <laughs> daring their service, and they were, oh, you're messing up the vibes. You know, you need to stop that. <laughs> uh, I mean, Buddhist, uh, Taoist, or animist, or any, all, I see all of this is you're going to basically hear what they know in three to six months. That's fundamentalism. Okay, now, in the Baptist world, uh, I would look at the fundamental Baptist, I came through that, as, as I would look at the Bible believers as a gold coin. And of course, I know the Bible believers don't bat a thousand, okay? But I'd look at the fundamental Baptist as a silver coin. And then all the other fundamentalists, I'd look at them as fiat currency, <laughs> okay? Fake money, <laughs> okay? But I, I mean, silver coin's better than fiat currency, it's got value, but if I'm going to pick a coin, I'm going to take that gold. Somebody's going to offer me a gold coin or a silver coin. I'm picking that gold. Yeah, okay, and so these are the subtle differences. If you will look in Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 26. Acts 20, verse 26. There we go. That's blowing it right on me. <laughs> Okay, this one is uh, Paul's farewell address to the church of Ephesus. And he said this, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you the fundamentals of the faith. <laughs> See that? Right. All. God's understanding is limitless, Amen. infinite. Amen. There's so much in this book has Amen. infinite Amen. knowledge and information. Amen. Okay? In Acts 24. Now, I, I would dare say, how do you know that if you're getting it right as far as believing all the Bible, it's when the fundamental Baptist say you're a heretic. Yep. When they say that, I say, thank you. Yeah, Acts 24, verse 14. I, I kind of find it that the last ditch effort in an argument with secular humanists or with the world in particular is when they run about all the arguments, you know what they call you? You're a racist. Yeah. Yeah. In the Christian world, the last argument they can say, you're lost and going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> you disagree with me, so you're a heretic. Right. Acts 24, 14, Paul said this, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy. Who's the they? In the context would be the fundamentalist of Judaism. The religious Judaizers said that Paul believed heresy. And then he said, So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. He said, so I believe all of it. And the religious fundamentalists say, you're a heretic. So when I catch wind, you know, of a Baptist in our area, I said, oh, that Hoffman, he's an idiot. He's, he's a heretic. And I, well, praise the Lord, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to have a truck stop service at a little chapel in the truck stop, you know, a couple, two, three, four truckers come in. And after I got done, one guy said to me, he was mad, he's going to criticize me. He said, you were 50% negative. And I said, oh, thanks. Yeah. He, he, he meant it as a criticism, right. and I took it as a compliment. He said, no, no, you didn't understand. You were 50% negative in this service. And I said, thanks. I appreciate that compliment. He, he could see I'm really dealing with an idiot here. And I said, come on, you're a trucker, right? Does your battery have a positive post and a negative post? Amen. Is that not 50%? Did not I do perfectly what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> he all walked out. <laughs> That's how it goes. You know, and, and you know, when I got in a car, you know, I think you ought to, you know, consider people's comments because you got blind spots. And so I just said, Lord, what about that? And you know, the Lord didn't answer me. <laughs> oh, okay. And then a week later, I gave the same 50% negative sermon, and 
two guys got saved, and I got in a car, and the Lord said, hey, what do you think about that? Amen. I said, yeah, what about that? <laughs> that was a blessing. Okay, now, my, my path, and some folks have a little different path, my path of fundamentalist ships that I've ridden on is I was born and raised Dutch Reformed, okay, and, and then I got saved, my parents got saved, my siblings got saved, my parents and about four or five cousins left the Dutch Corner Church and uh, started what was called a community Bible church. And back in the 60s, those were pretty, pretty solid churches back in the 60s. The new versions had not gotten in. They were Baptistic, but they didn't have Baptist on the door. But they're just coming out of the Dutch Reformed viewpoint. They did not have the new uh, contemporary garbage going on. That was just beginning to start. So it was a, it was a wonderful church. We had a wonderful pass for five years, and then he left, and a second guy came in, and a second guy started bringing in new versions, and he was a Calvinist in some, in some ways, and, and my dad would question things, and finally dad said, we got to leave. We left. Okay, and so then we went to a fundamental Baptist church, and that's where we got introduced to the Hiles Anderson ways, fundamental Baptist, and all this stuff, and I learned some good things in there, and you learn good things all along the way, and then you learn some not good things all along the way, and the great Bible teacher, the number one Bible teacher, Hiles Anderson, when we were there, is now serving a sentence in prison for 110 years. His wife is serving 58 years for unbelievable abuse to adopt a daughter. And it's like, and this, this is not a one-time event where this is a common occurrence with pastors in that faction. Why? Because they teach blind loyalty. So who's going to question it? And then they teach that a pastor is like the king in the Old Testament. I'm like, are you kidding me? So they kind of get too high Amen. big for their britches, and then the, the devil's got to knock them down. Well, I, I'm riding that for a while, and, and I started noticing the leaks in the boat. And then I, as I'm in the, you know, out on the ocean and I can feel the ships going down, I'm trying to figure out what do we do. I see this ship going by that had AV-1611 on a banner. Amen. I thought, oh, let's try that one. So, I, you know, we paddled over to that one and got on that one. And I started questioning some things, you know, is Ruckman right about this? He's got to be exaggerating. So I, I wrote to schools and started asking all these questions. Boy, did I learn some things. <laughs> and I got in that ship. You know, crazy thing, there are some guys riding this ship where they're on the deck and they say, oh, I found a leak and there's some water there. And I said, well, let me go investigate. And I'd get a towel and wipe it up. Hey, there ain't no water here, you dirty dog. If you don't like this ship, get off of it. Amen. I said, hey, what's that bucket over there and that string? Right. You put it over the side, you dirty dog. Yeah, There's no leaks in this old ship. Yeah, and I, that's what I was looking for yeah. through many years. Yeah, man, that, that fired me up, and, man, I have been living off that joy ever since. Yeah, but I would give you some of the dangers of fundamentalism. Remember that it was the conservative Orthodox or the fundamental Judaizers who instigated the crucifixion. They would be the greatest promoters of religious persecution in anybody. Fundamentalist Muslims. I used to hate it when the news media said that, but now I get a kick out of it. Okay? Um, who started the persecution in America? Okay, the pilgrims, the Calvinists, the Puritans came from, they fled to Europe to come here because of the persecution of the Catholics. And then when the Calvinists got in charge of Massachusetts, what did they do? They started persecuting nonconformists. Roger Williams was the, one of the first ones. And Roger Williams with four other people or five people fled down to a location that eventually became Providence, Rhode Island, established the very first Baptist church in the, in the new land. They had the freest of all the colonies on religion. And as far as the free exercise of religion, that came from Rhode Island. And Baptist preachers, and uh, they were being thrown in jail because they wouldn't pay the tax in Virginia because the Anglicans were charging the tax. And the Baptists said, we ain't paying for it. So they had to have some Dutch blood in them. And so they're in jail, and the people would say, they can't come to us. We can go to them. So they'd get around the jail, and they'd say, we're here. Preach to us. And they'd preach at them. 
James Madison, as a little boy in the early 1700s, his dad would take him by the hand and go to the jail and listen to these preachers. Patrick Henry was a man who was an attorney at the time that he would defend these Baptist preachers in Virginia and try to get them out of jail, pay their bond or whatnot, defend them in court. James Madison lived down the road from John Leland, a pastor, a Baptist pastor, and when Madison wrote, showed him the uh, Constitution that he'd drawn up, he said, you got nothing in there on the free exercise of religion. Hence they threw in the Ten Bill of Rights. we got such a marvelous history in our country. Now, it's all ignored by people. Patrick Henry, when he became the very first governor of Virginia, the Baptists got together and they wrote a formal letter and they were thanking God because Patrick Henry became their first governor. Why? Because they were defending the free exercise of what they called religion. Okay, and so it was the Calvinists that were killing them up there in Massachusetts or persecuting them. Okay, and it was this idea, and it was the Anglicans down here in Virginia. So fundamentalism doesn't have a good track record in any religion. Okay, it was during the Vietnam War days when the Catholic DM of South Vietnam, where the priest down there was saying that Mary had fled North Vietnam and came to South Vietnam, and then the Buddhists, man, they know how to protest. The way they protested, they'd pour themselves with gasoline and torch themselves. That was a religious war at the beginning. See, and so that's that, that fundamental philosophy that uh, we're going to kill you if you don't believe what we believe. Yeah. So here are some of the basic differences that I see between Bible, believing, Bible believers, Bible believing Baptists versus fundamental Baptists. Okay, here's some of the the differences I see. The first one is one glorifies the words of God and the other promotes the fundamentals of the faith. Okay, we look at the words of God and glorify the actual words. They'll say the fundamentals, they'll say something like this, principles, concepts, Okay, instructions of the Bible. Okay, but what they're looking at is the words, or they're looking at the text, the verbally inspired original autographs, the text, not the words themselves. In John chapter 1, verse 1, you have a, an uppercase W, and that's found seven times in the Bible, and you got all of them written by John the Apostle. And when it's an uppercase W, that means flesh and blood word of God when Jesus was on earth, but now it's the flesh and bones word of God. When it's a lowercase W, that is paper and ink word of God. That's the practice of the Bible. Okay, and so uh, we never, a Bible believer doesn't add, subtract, or change any words of the Bible. They change their beliefs to match the Bible, but a fundamentalist will change the Bible to match their beliefs. I mean, that's just a common practice. Okay, many years ago, uh, a few years ago, I, I observed some of Kurt Cameron's stuff online. I don't know if you know Kurt Cameron. Uh, he has a way of the master, uh, and they go out. They don't go street preaching. They do interviews and stuff like that. But I received a blessing out of some of that. And so I sent Kurt a Bible, a reference Bible, and uh, he called me to thank me for it. And he says, I see that you're King James. And I said, yeah, a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, he says, you know, I, I would like to be. I said, really? He said, can you give me a real good argument? I said, well, let's see if we can run a few for you. And I ran a few, and no, that don't work for me, and I ran another, no, that don't work for me. And then he had to pick up his kids, and he, I, the way the conversation started, I figured the way I was interpreting his communication was he thought that this was going to be a short one, that I was going to blast them. That's what he was expecting. But when I was kind to him, we had a, you know, he stopped. He said, I got to go get my kids. I'll call you right back. So he called me back. And so then I started running a few more ideas to him. No, that don't work for me. No, that don't work for me. And I said, let me try this one. Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is called the Word of God? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is Jesus Christ perfect and holy today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, then why do you believe there's no perfect and holy Bible today? He goes, oh, oh, oh. I said, did that do the trick? Oh. I said, let me give you one more. 
Rat poison is 99.95% nutritious. And any of the guys will say the new Bibles are 95 to 99% pure. Rat poison, it's that 0.05% that gets you. He goes, oh. I said, isn't it a blessing? And then, then, and then you can see, I can almost hear the devil's working on them. And he says, are you saying my pastor's of the devil? I said, I don't know your pastor. I don't know who he is. I'm just telling you, there's a perfect Bible available today. Amen. Well, I know James White personally. I said, I don't care. Right. So what if you know James White personally? Right. And, and then he said, could I call you back in a couple weeks if I got some more questions? You, you can call me back anytime you want. But your old devil boy, he got working on that. Yeah. Hadn't heard from him since. Now he's promoting to Geneva. Why? Because he's a Calvinist. That's very sad. Okay. Uh, now, a Bible believer will ac actually exalt this book. Amen. He'll brag about the book. Amen. Psalm 138, 2, God's magnified his word above Amen. his name. Uh, several years ago, uh, we were knocking on doors in a little place called Mount Air. There's no mountain there. It's flat as could be. Well, now there's a mountain. It's a dump. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Jan came across this assistant pastor of Burr Oak Mennonite Church. It's a liberal Mennonite, and the liberal Mennonites tend to be better on salvation than the strict Mennonites. And he said, all I've heard about your pastor is he's King James. And so she said, would you like to talk to him? He said, yeah, I would. So I went and chatted with him. He was a New American Standard guy. He didn't like the NIV. And I said, well... He went to John MacArthur's school, master, the Master's College. And so I just gently started showing him, said, said, you don't like the NIV? I said, it's the same manuscript in the American Standard. I pointed out the verses that were missing, pointed out the italicized words. He said, I've never heard this before. I said, eh, first time for everything. And he said, you know, they just kept attacking my book. And I felt like if I would learn Greek and Hebrew, I would really get the answers. I said, that's how it goes. I'm sorry you had to experience that. And so we parted company. Two, three months go by, and I went and visited him again. He said, you'll be happy to know I switched to King James. I said, well, that's good, but the thing is, do you believe it? Right. He said, no. I said, then it doesn't matter. It's very sad. Right. But that, happens all, that almost happened to me because I went to Grace College, a Plymouth Brethren school, Calvinist school, and, uh, and the professor said, read through the New Testament, but don't, I would not suggest read through the King James. I'd suggest to get a new Bible. So I did what he said. I went and got me an NIV and started reading through it. And I thought, man, I, I've memorized Scripture as a kid. Which one do I memorize? And you know what the, the feeling is? Forget it. Yeah. Don't memorize. Yeah. And that's, that's actually it does the opposite of what people think. So the one glorifies the words of God, the other promotes the fundamentals of the faith. The second one is one glorifies or magnifies doctrine, and the other insists upon instruction. Okay, so the only way they use the Bible is to teach instruction, devotion, spiritual application, motivational application. And most preachers, especially in the fundamental Baptist movement, are nothing but cheerleaders. Rah, 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 go get them, go get them, rah, rah, make sure you're here, rah, rah, bring your tithe, rah, rah, rah. And that's really all they are, doctrine. Doesn't the preacher supposed to labor in word and doctrine, 1 Timothy chapter 4? Isn't that why God gave us the complete revelation of the Bible? All scriptures given by inspiration of God is proper for doctrine. Doesn't Titus chapter 2 verse 1 says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine? Amen. Do you remember the promise keepers in the past where they had that group together? And they openly said, you got to put aside doctrine to attend. And there was a lady in our area. She was complaining, you know, as part of our health food co-op. And she was come. my husband won't go to promise keepers. <laughs> Thoughting, she thought I would, you know, try to encourage her and all this stuff. And I said, oh, he's probably a man then. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, we call them the promise weepers. Yeah, I mean, how do you have a successful meeting when a bunch of men are hugging on each yeah. other crying? I mean, that's not a successful meeting. 
<laughs> but how, how, do you, how do you get together and put aside doctrine? What do you want me to do, throw out my Bible? You see, now, here we got a book. If you look at the Bible from a doctor, God gave us a Bible for two basic reasons in 2 Timothy. Doctrine, reproof, correction. Now, those two are the result of doctrine and instruction. Now, if you hold this Bible in the air, if you look at it from a doctrinal viewpoint, you're looking at it from God's perspective, from a, and God gets heavenly blessings, and that adjusts our conscience. That gives us a proper attitude. When we look at it from an instructional viewpoint, we're looking at it from an earthly viewpoint, we're looking at it from this perspective, spiritual, practical, devotional, motivational, okay, like the 12 spies. The 12 spies obeyed the instructions. Did they not? Yes. They went to the land of Canaan. Two believed the doctrine. Yeah, amen. They believed the promises, the doctrinal promises. Now, when we look at the Bible, the viewpoint of the scriptures, we get blessings by the instructions, and it forms proper actions. God gets the blessings from the doctrine. That forms a proper attitude in our conscience. Okay, if you would look at Psalm 15, and I'll give you an example of them both. Doctrine and instruction. Psalm 15, very short, so it's a quickie, you run right through it. So I'm going to look at it first from a devotional viewpoint. This is how Matthew Henry commentary would describe it, most any commentary. So he would say, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So instruction, who's going to go to heaven? And then it says, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness speaketh the truth in his heart. Who's going to go to heaven? You have to have the righteousness of God to go to heaven. See, it says righteousness. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So if you have the righteousness of Christ, you should not backbite to your neighbor. You should make sure you guard your tongue. I mean, this is what the psalmist is encouraging. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt, you shouldn't honor vile people. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. You should hang around God's people, people that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. You keep your word as a believer. Your word is good as your bond. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh a, re a reward against the innocent. So you don't hoard your money. You want to make sure you give your money, especially to me. And so that's how it goes. And then he says, he that doeth these things shall never be moved because you have eternal security. Now, what did I do? I had to stretch those words, did I not? Now, I looked at that from a Baptistic viewpoint in the New Testament. Now, let's look at it from God's perspective. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? What tabernacle? Ephesians 40 to 48, the most important doctrine. Who's going into the millennial age? Who's going into the millennium? He that walketh uprightly, why? Faith and works during the tribulation. And worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth, backbiteth not his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. What neighbor? The neighbor in the tribulation will be the Jews and the Arabs. Add on your... And then he says, and take, nor taketh up a reproach against the neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. What vile person? The Antichrist. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Now the next phrase is going to put the really tie it. He that putteth not out his money to usury. Okay, usury is the old English word for interest. Okay, let's have testimony time. Has anybody got a savings account that collects interest? Life insurance policy? Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody got a life insurance checking account with it? You wicked heathen. Y'all yeah. <laughs> going to hell. <laughs> well, that's what it says, does it not? Yes, it does. When you stick with doctrine, you got to be strict with those words. Instruction, you can stretch it. 
Okay? Why would he say that? In the tribulation time period, the only way you could put your money out to usury is you've got the mark or the number. That's why the epistle of James, every rich person is damned. Why? Because they got in the system, per se. That's why that's written like that. It makes no sense at all if you don't understand doctrine. Amen. Probably the psalm that is read at almost virtually any funeral is Psalm 23. How many people know that's the second coming? That's a millennial psalm. What a glorious psalm. When you understand the doctrines of the Bible, the words pop off the page. And boy, do they get meaning when you see the doctrine. And God in heaven is saying, I don't like that. They, they're looking at it from my perspective. You see, you believe the doctrines, and that results in blessings from God. You obey the instruction, and that results in blessings from God. You see, now, yeah, a person can be out of balance. An overbalance of doctrine breeds dullness. An overbalance of instruction breeds shallowness. Okay, many... Many of the people that went to school that I went to, Hiles Anderson, for a few years, and when their faith got shook because of the behavior of either Dave Hiles or Jack Hiles or Jack, Jack Scott, you didn't know where they were going to land. Were they going to go contemporary? Were they going to do this? Were they going to do that? Why? Because they were, we were not taught any doctrine. No doctrine. It was all devotional, all instruction, Nothing about that. And so you didn't know which way were they were going. I saw one of the guys that I went to school, you know, and it was at a homeschool conference, one of Bill Gothard's homeschool conference. Now, my nature is if I see somebody that I have known in the past, you know, and they didn't see me, I kind of sort of kind of hide. <laughs> but this is one that I couldn't avoid. <laughs> okay. And he wasn't a real good acquaintance. If it's a good acquaintance, definitely I'm going to search him out. But... We came right by, and we got chat, and he said, Dave, he said, I hate to ask you, but you still married? I said, yeah. Yeah, my fourth wife, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I didn't get a divorce. I just kept adding them. <laughs> Mormons. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, you wouldn't believe how many. I said, I know. I know. Yeah. Sad. Yes, sir. It's very sad. Yes, sir. Okay, and so that's that one. If a Bible believer will promote or exalt doctrine, where a fundamentalist will promote the, the instructions. The third thing is one desires to obey the first command. The other strives to enforce the second command. Okay, the first command, what I'm referring to this is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. The second is, love thy neighbor as thyself. So... The Bible believer is concerned about my offense toward God. Amen. Okay, where Paul said he's lived his life void of offense toward God first and man second. So we ought to strive to not offend our God. But when a person switches those two, then they become a Christian secularist or a Christian humorist, and then they are more concerned about offending their fellow man and that's where political correctness comes in, so that that shuts your eye, believer. Now, I'm thinking you've got to be wise, and you use a little humor, and you can get your point across in a nice way, but it still gets in there when it's needed to be. Okay, and uh, in Matthew 15, the Lord's sitting down, and he offended the Pharisees. And the disciples, did you know you offended the Pharisees? Let them know. Let the blind lead the blind to both fall in the ditch. Yeah. He wasn't real concerned about that. Right. If truth offends, it offends. Amen. Now, if it's our personality or if it's our technique, okay, then we should learn from that and try to do it in the right fashion. A people who are easily offended in Matthew 24, that's a sign of the second coming. Yeah. I mean, you can't say anything nowadays. Yeah. Not a thing. Yeah. And that's because people are so hypersensitive, they're madly in love with themselves. And that's, that's really a sign 
uh, of the Lord's coming. Okay, now if a person strives to enforce, now I'm saying enforce the second command. How do they do that? They by bullying people, by manipulating them. You need to do this, do that, do this. And what they do in the, in the soul winning methods, the soul winner becomes the hero. But when God throws somebody in hell, he is right. Yeah, amen. And you know who's witnessing to those people more than you and I ever will? God is. Yeah, amen. John 1, 9, he lightens the heart of every man. John 1, 20, he has a creation witnessing to them. John uh, 2, or Revelation, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2, verse 15, he's got their conscience that's witnessing to them at all times. He is continually working on people. Amen. Now, we need to do our part also. Okay, but the Lord loves them more than I do. You know, I was desiring to try to get a church started before we got to Rensselaer. And, I, you know, Lord, oh God, oh God, oh God, you help me. And it's like the Lord said, shut up. He says, don't you think I love them more than you do? Yeah, I oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> of course you do. You know, and so the Lord will put us where he wants us yeah. and we're just required we're just obligated to do what we can Amen. that's all we're obligated to do and so one desires to obey the first command and the other strives to enforce the second command okay so this idea of offense where do you draw the line okay we had a lady that worked at a restaurant up in our area and some lesbos were coming through and uh, they had a meeting and said these, they didn't say lesbos, but the, the uh, <laughs> coming through and we have to serve them. And as a waitress, she knew that she had to. Okay, but then right out front, they put the flag, the fag flag. Okay, and there's the problem. It's not that you're uh, having tolerance, you are now promoting it. And so they asked her about it. She said, I got a problem with that. They fired her. Okay, and so I asked her, you know, about how that went. She's, and they didn't give her a, you know, final hearing and all this stuff. And so I wrote a few papers for her to try to help her out, and, you know. And I got a little pay out of them, you know. And then they asked her, who did your paper? Well, I'm not telling you who did it. Well, her preacher did. <laughs> It's just a few papers that you just write a few things in there, get online, look at the statutes, throw in some legalese, and they think some attorney did it. <laughs> Once I did it for my dad, and he netted 15 grand out of it. If these attorneys for this big utility company would have known I did it, three pages, I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, well, you just throw it in there. <laughs> Uh, I learned some of this law stuff from a, a Lutheran out of Wisconsin. <laughs> we hosted law classes, so I learned some things through the way. But uh, a fundamentalist will strive to enforce the second coming. A Bible believer will obey the first command. Okay, the fourth thing is one focuses on the primary ministry, the other focuses on the secondary. Okay, what do I mean by that? If you would look in 2 Corinthians. Okay, remember that 2 Corinthians is a letter about the ministry. And you'll find the word ministry or ministration all through there. And here is, you know, are you in a full-time Christian service? You most certainly are when you got born again. <laughs> now, what's your most important ministry for you? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... Okay, what ministry? Well, when you see therefore, you look in front of it to see what it's there for. And verse 17 of chapter 3 says, For the Lord is that spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. What's the ministry? You putting your eyes and your face in this book. Amen. And the mirror, the reflection of Jesus Christ will come off the page. Amen. And when your heart's right, you will start to reflect like Amen. him. That's your most important ministry. 
Okay, now in chapter 5, verse 18 is what people usually call the ministry, the secondary. This is the outward aspect. All th in, in verse 8, for all, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, the outward ministry. Who are we reconciling? To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Okay, so that's the outward ministry of reconciliation, of reaching out to others, saying, this God gives me so much joy. Would you like to experience that? Okay, now that's, that is what's commonly called the ministry, but when you hear somebody who's active about the second one, and then they fall by the wayside or commit some sin or whatnot, what happened? They neglected the first one a long time ago. So our first one is our walk with God, and our second one is our work for God. So when you hear of a couple where they come to the marriage altar and say, I love you, and then three years later wanting to kill each other, <laughs> they stop the walk. They're too busy working. They're getting boggled with the work, and they've stopped the walk with each other. And so you got to get that relationship where it should be. So our walk with God is first, and then our work from God should be an outward byproduct of that. But most will put, you know, like a guilt trip on them. Okay? And, and in the fundamental Baptist world, you know, they're always going to say building baptism budgets and always church attendance. Three to thrive, three to thrive, three to thrive. Church attendance. You know one thing they never, there's one thing that, Kansas City and San Francisco never told their players to do. Now, one time that their coaches say, you're required to go to the huddle. <laughs> That's understood. Yeah. They don't say that to those, okay, every, every time now, you know you got to go to the huddle. No, I want to stay over here, coach. <laughs> you got to go to the huddle and then bring your offering. <laughs> No, that's just understood. How are we going to know the play if we don't go to the huddle? Amen. You know, and they don't do that. Now, if you would look in Luke chapter 10, service is demanded or bullied. Guilt trip. In, in Luke chapter 10, okay, if, if God it gave you the cross that he gave Richard Wormbrand, and you were three years in solitary confinement, how could you serve God? Couldn't pass out tracts, couldn't witness to somebody. How could you serve God? Well, I suppose the sacrifice of praise mentioned in Hebrews 13. Okay, but in Luke chapter 10, you have verse 38, a wonderful story, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, it says, Now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also, notice where Mary was at, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Mary was a student, Martha was a servant. Not bad. It's not bad. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. She's getting burned out. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Isn't that like sisters? <laughs> Bid her, therefore, to help me. She's a fundamentalist. Get out here and help me. If you don't do it, I'm going to get mad at you. <laughs> and Jesus said unto her, Martha, Martha. Now, I have found seven times in the Bible where somebody's name said twice. That's like first and middle name. When mom said first and middle name, you knew she wanted your attention. <laughs> Six of them are men. Abraham, Abraham. Okay. Uh, Jacob, Jacob. Peter. He said, Simon, Simon. And here he said, Martha, Martha. He looked at her, loved her. She was serving. She's getting worn out. She's getting burned out. 
She said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful, full of care, troubled about many things. One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her, implying that it can be taken away from Martha. See, now, here, here's an idea about Mary. People say, well, you're just sitting around studying the Bible. You know, you know, you know. No, you've got to be like a sponge where you're soaking it in, and then you go out in public and you squeeze it. You got to in and out or else it gets stale. Now, Mary's labor of love was recorded three times. Three times on that Sabbath, that 10th day of the month, before the Passover, when they pick out the Passover lamb on the 10th day of the month, Mary took this anointment, anointed Jesus Christ for his burial. She did the right thing at the right time. The ladies that came to the sepulcher to anoint the body did the right thing at the wrong time. Mary's service was recorded three times. And she could actually say, I did the right thing at the right time. She had read that Passover lamb where they picked that lamb out on the 10th day of the month and sanctified it. And then on the 14th day of the month, they sacrificed it. And the Lord Jesus was sacrificed on that 14th day of the month. She did the right thing at the right time, and her service was a service of love and joy. Boy, she hit it right on. You see, it's not that we, have, we just do the primary part. We have the primary and the secondary, but we make sure we get them in the right order. You see, the right time, everything is beautiful in his time. You see, everything is. And a lot of times we're just running on this treadmill, and the Lord says, get off the treadmill. Spend some time with me for a while, and then run out there, or you do something, get something done. You see, and so she did the right thing at the right time with the joy that she had. And the last one is one exalts the second coming, and the other declares the first coming. Okay, if you go to a Catholic church, you go to, what are you going to see? You're going to see a crucifix, right. first coming. Right. Get him off the cross. Come on. Amen. He's not on that. Amen. What's the big day on God's calendar? Okay, what's the big day? Parents, you, you got kids. If you had an unfortunate situation where you buried a child, are you going to put that day and circle it on your calendar and then every day rejoice on that day? You're going to have a heartbreak. It's going to come around every single year. You don't celebrate the death of your child. And the Lord God in heaven, he is, you're going to celebrate. You circle the day when your child got maybe an award in school or they got honored. That's the day you're going to remember, parents. And the day God's going to remember is when his son becomes king. And you'll see that filtered all through the Gospels where Jesus will hit this and hit this. There's going to be a day I'm going to be king. Amen. You see, that's the big day in God's calendar. That's the main doctrine of the Bible. That's where we, it's so important to God. One of the crowns given out of the judgment seat are people who love his appearing. You see, and who love his appearing. There's, there's a group years ago, they was of the Catholic persuasion in 1999, and they were tired of waiting for the Lord to come back. And so they would take some DNA off of the Catholic relics that they got, you know, the Shroud of Turn, and they thought that they would implant it in a virgin, and they would clone Jesus and make him come back on Christmas Day at the beginning of 2000. It was an actual website. It was called clonejesus.com. I downloaded some of the info I got it and all that stuff because it's not there anymore. What are they doing? They're just crazy. Yeah. They're trying to force the second coming. And you can't force that. Right. The big day on the calendar for you and I is Calvary. Yeah. That's the big day. That's when we got in. Amen. Okay, it's the birth of the believer. That's why I guess we celebrate birthdays. Okay, but when it gets to, you know, the coming of Christ, you know, to be honest, to be honest, when do you pray for the rapture more? Yeah. Right. When things are pretty raunchy. We're not loving his appearing at the time. We're loving our disappearing. Right. And, of course, that will fix all our problems. But that's the, that's the thing. is The one exalts the second coming of Christ, and the other declares the first coming of Christ. Now, if you would, a couple more places. Matthew 23. Now, I'm not saying, 
fundamental Baptists are bad people. There are a lot of good people in that movement, and I can learn from them. I can learn from them. Unfortunately, a lot of them will consider me a heretic so they can't learn from me. That's not my loss. It's my gain because I can learn from them. I can learn from anybody. And so the Lord actually said this in Matthew 23, and this would be the religious fundamentals of his day. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And then he said this, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. See, a lot of people, when they get hurt by him, they get bitter, and they're not going to listen to anything they say. Jesus said, Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. You see, we, we divorce personality from words. But don't limit God to a small set of fundamentals because God is infinite. His understanding is infinite. Now, when we study these other areas, we do maintain a priority. Okay, where there are some things that are more important. Okay, and so obviously you can get your finger cut off and still live. Get your heart cut out. That's obviously a priority. So in Matthew 23, Jesus says in verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of men and a nice and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. See, so the Lord was saying, hey, there are priorities. There are weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So as we study any area that God would lead us, and through the years, if the Lord would give me a witness about one thing, he'd give me a second witness. The second witness, you know, about the same topic, is that's about the time I said, okay, I'll look at it. It would come from out of nowhere. One witness, three, four days later, second witness. Maybe it'd be on health, maybe it'd be on law, maybe it'd be on any topic. I said, okay, I'll take a look at that. Okay, and, and that's how the Lord kind of starts giving us some ideas. Now, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, it, says, it shows that there are some strange doctrines in the Bible. <laughs> oh, strange doctrines. And I can give you some of them. <laughs> Okay, and they're out there. And, it, and when you do that, you kind of look at that book and say, that's, right. you know, and he said, but he said, don't be occupied with the strong meat. Right. Okay, don't get occupied. Learn some of it, you know, like out on the street. I've talked to people, you know, one trucker that he said, man, we were parked in this place. And we saw this UFO above this electrical thing, and he was sucking juice out of that. And I was like, I believe you. You do? Yeah, I've studied a little bit of that. Right. And I was able to take that and bring it to the Bible. Yeah, amen. You know a little bit about those things, and you can discuss it with people. And then he says in Hebrews 13, 9, we ought to be occupied with grace. Yeah. Amen. See, with grace. Amen. So we understand, we, we look at this vast sea of knowledge that's available for us. And we got a Bible that brings us into the standard, but yet then we focus on the priorities. You see, the larger the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder. And it's all around us. And our God is infinite. And people like to put him in a little box of a little fundamentalist system because it makes me feel important. But let's spend time making God feel important. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray. You